I've seen these two, boy, they've really have had a career so far. I remember you were a line cook at 312 Chicago under Dean Zanella. That's correct. You worked for Karin Greveson at Avec. Correct. You had a little tiny place called Scylla in Bucktown, um, right at Armitage and Damon, where my bank is across the street. <laughs> and now look at the two of you. Look at you. Wow. Mazel tov. Look, look at you. That yeah. All right. So... We're going we're gonna to talk about the solutions, I guess, for the future of food, but I kind of want to talk about what are the problems. I look, you both have new books out, by the way, um, and you'll be signing books uh, afterward outside, I know. But uh, your book, Sam, you really had a front row seat uh, for six or seven years with the Obama administration, and you were, as she said, senior adv advisor and policy, mm -hmm. and you worked on the Let's Move with the First Lady. Yeah. But the problem in the book that I saw was really food waste. That's a big problem. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think we're facing a lot of challenges uh, when it comes to our, our food system, what we eat. I mean, if you step back and think about it, um, f you know, food is the second, food and agriculture is the second leading cause of greenhouse gas emissions uh, worldwide. Um, and we, our system is degrading the very inputs that we need to sustain it, namely soil and water at alarming rates, where all of our aquifers are basically tapped. We've lost the vast majority of our soil. Um, we do also waste in the United States, about 40% of what you produce, which is just insane. If you, I mean, imagine like Exxon pumping out a bunch of oil and just like chucking 40% of it. It's an, it's an insane part of, of our system. And we're getting outcomes that are um, uh, fundamentally unsustainable. Uh, it's in, food and ag is the number one cause of preventable death and disease. We have one third of our youngest kids are on track to have diabetes. There's 79 million pre-diabetics in this country. So you have a system that's uh, in its entirety in a very inefficient and, and completely unsustainable. So the question becomes, you know, what do, we, what do we have to do? What changes do we have to make both, mostly in our culture really, um, to start you know, turning around the ship? And our culture has become so much about food and consuming and watching people cook on television and going to chefs' restaurants who they see on television. And you've got three restaurants now, right? So what have you seen, you were talking backstage about compost being an issue, what have you seen as some of the problems and things you're trying to rectify? Sure, I mean, in talking about food waste, I started working with Morton Salt, they launched a whole program about reducing food waste. Um, and I think for me, it's really just seeing that we can all make tiny little changes that are going to help the big system. I, uh, coming here today, I would say, I'm not nervous in talking in front of people, but I'm nervous in talking about things that I feel like, I feel like we do a lot of things in the restaurants. We compost, I was telling you, we have over 10,000 pounds between the three restaurants of compost that are getting picked up a month now. Um, so I'm so happy that we're doing that, knowing that we weren't doing that um, a year or so ago. Um, but I think what I've learned most about learning more about food waste and the, you know, 40% is, it's crazy. It's not just that we're throwing the food away. Think about all the work that goes into that, yeah. all of the, um, the natural resources that are wasted by wasting that food. It's more than just, so now when I open my refrigerator and I have a, a two year old, so I have a lot more food in the fridge these days instead of just like beer and ranch dressing. Um, <laughs> but, maybe, maybe a little hot sauce. Yeah. <laughs> But instead, of, now I look in there and I think, I really think to myself, okay, like what do I have in here right now that I can put together to make dinner and I'm not gonna just waste things and throw them away. I think the more that we, it's more about raising awareness and making us all kind of think a little smarter about every little decision that we make. Um, I'll let, you know, Sam or some people that can see the bigger picture a little bit better than me and maybe make, you know, some bigger changes and bigger impacts. Um, but I'm really trying to start small in my own life and also mm -hmm. at the restaurants. Um, and just kind of raise awareness among my staff and amongst you know people around me, and just talking about it more. By the way, I'm glad you shattered that myth of the the sort of the celeb chef at home with a little kid rolling out this huge Ina Garten spread for your child every yeah. day because that doesn't happen. You have no it time does. to do that, right? It's true. Um, you talked about incremental changes, both of you. Okay, so in your book, you say you know make one little step at a time, one more fruit, one less meat. Yeah. That will have a ripple effect down the way. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think. You know, we, we constantly hear from, uh, you know, writers and so-called experts uh, who pontificate about these, these big ideals about how we should be eating, the right way to eat. It needs to be healthy and local and sustainable and biodynamic and on and on and on and on. Um, and, you know, these, these utopic visions of how people should be eating just don't have anything to do with the reality that people are, you know, facing in their own lives. 
um, trying to get dinner on the table on a Tuesday night. And by the way, like most of those people don't eat that way themselves either. Um, but do you, and, like, do you and, like, like Michael Pollan, you know, eat food yes, like a little Pollen. bit, mostly plants. Uh, yeah, no, I think Michael Pollan has been brilliant in uh, simplifying a lot of these messages. And on those messages, you can't say it better than that. Hmm. Some of the other things that uh, have been put out there, like the fact that we eat what we eat or the price of junk food is, is such compared to healthy food because of government subsidies, unfortunately, is just fundamentally inaccurate. So there's, we have a challenge of oversimplification of complex issues. The reality is that we're very efficient in growing corn and soy, the underpinning of, of unhealthy food, uh, because we've invested hundreds of billions of dollars for about 75 years into figuring out how to grow it really efficiently. Mm. Um, and we've invested, as a comparison, literally almost zero dollars over those same times in making fruits and vegetables, uh, growing them in a much more efficient way. So that's where the big price disparity comes from. So anyway, so there's some really good things there in when we oversimplify these, 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 uh, these, these complicated issues. But I think the point is for people to understand that there is no such thing as a right way to eat and a wrong way to eat. That, but there is an idea of we can do better than we're doing now. And so if we don't root the solutions into the reality that people are facing, what happens is we all try to eat in this perfect way, it doesn't happen, and then we get super discouraged, and then we sort of give up and end up going back to the way we were doing business. And that's what we have to change. OK, I want to go back. You were just talking about the, the corn and soybean being efficient and fruits and vegetables. Yeah, I digress. You, you, this is, but you this is interesting. It because, so I as a, to say it. I'm, a, I'm a sort of as a naive, Sorry. as the layman who read Omnivore's Dilemma, and I think, OK, well, the big problem was the farm bill. We're subsidizing things, and we're making corn and soy cheap, mm -hmm. high fructose corn syrup as a result of the cheap corn. Um, we should be making fruits and vegetables really cheap and affordable. Mm -hmm. And so isn't, isn't the farm bill, is that part of the issue? Again, I have no idea what I'm talking about in terms of government like <laughs> you did, but that was my understanding, that there was a, an issue that we need to make the fruits and vegetables as inexpensive as the corn. Yeah, I guess my only argument is that the way you do it is not through subsidies. Because subsidies are actually not. So I, OK, so I walked in the White House excited with my undivorced dilemma under my arm, uh, ready to change the farm bill. And by, it turns out we did. Those subsidies that he talked about, we got rid of. Um, and I couldn't find one economist, agricultural economist, that said if you got rid of that subsidy regime, that acreage would change in any kind of significant way over like maybe a shift around 1% of what was actually grown. The, the, we're, we're, we're growing corn because we can, farmers can do it in an incredibly efficient way. We're, we're externalizing a bunch of the costs, right? So it's not, there's not, we're not taking in the full cost of what it means to grow corn, but they can grow it very efficiently. And um, there's a lot of uses for it. Uh, and they can get a consistent price on it. The, the subsidy policies are stupid policies. We're giving money to people who shouldn't be getting it in the way that they're getting it. But we're not going to subsidize fruits and vegetables to make them the cost go it. Mainly because people who grow fruits and vegetables don't want the subsidies. Mm. California growers like that there's no subsidies. They fight against them because they don't want a bunch of people growing fruits and vegetables. So when the people who would benefit from getting a subsidy um, don't want it, you can be sure that in Washington it's not going to happen. So I just think we have to think more pragmatically about and even if you gave a you know, few billion dollars for fruits and vegetables, you're not going to see some kind of systematic change. We have to figure out how we're going to get these, um, these, the nourishment to people at a price that they can afford. And that's going to be much more than just a little government subsidy. And then on the local level for you, I mean, you are feeding a lot of people. You must do your, you know, your table counts, what you're doing every day and every week. Um, that has a big impact on what's going on in Chicago, right? So it do does. you think like pretty deep and pretty hard about... OK, we've got to be pretty clear here about the farmers we're working with and you know, aside from the waste issue. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, just in what you were talking about, and I think a lot of the government stuff, I'm not going to lie, I'm like, Ooh. Yeah. Um, me But too. just on a simpler talk of like, the world that's around me and what I feel like I've learned from working with some of our farmers, um, mm -hmm. we have a farmer, Spence Farm, Marty from Spence Farm, who you've probably met. He's amazing. He mm. can talk all of your ears off about farming and um, organics and just He's connected with the land in a way that I've never seen anyone mm -hmm. before. But he um, is trying to just encourage mm -hmm. other farmers around him that do grow corn and soybeans, that they can grow vegetables and they can sell it to people in the city. And kind of just yeah. starting with education in his part of the world, which is about an hour south of here, um, 
And for us, it's, I'm not gonna stand up here and pretend that we don't serve, that we serve everything in our restaurants from local farms. Because if you've been to Girl on the Goat in the middle of winter, it's not just potatoes. Um, and maybe some apples that are coming towards the end of their prime. Um, <laughs> because nobody would eat there. So it's unfortunate that we can't do that, and I, it makes me want to move to California for all the more reasons than just beach, but um, I think it's about trying our best to do the best that we can. So we have, I just actually was on the phone with one of my farmers today with Nick Nichols from Nichols Farm, which oh, is yeah. a, it's a big farm, and then there's some farmers that don't like the big farm because for other reasons. Um, but I was having a whole chat with him about organics, and if he does, why isn't he a certified organic farm? And um, just kind of getting into his mind about that, and it's because for two of the things he grows, for apples and corn, the organic practices aren't working for him. He was like, well, nobody wants to eat a worm in their apple. And I was like, okay, I see your point. Um, so you but we, it, we could okay. have had a whole long debate about this for hours, and I was like, I need to leave to go to this event. Um, but, <laughs> but I think, um, for me, it's about trying to connect with my farmers, understanding their practices, making sure to work with farmers where at, just because you eat something that's local, it doesn't mean that it's that's done right. properly right. and that they're respecting the land. I think right. we've driven down to Fairbury many times to visit where our goats come from, and we've passed by many farms that are doing things that I you know, wouldn't want to tell you about. Um, and, I, and so I don't use those farms. Um, but I, so we're trying our best to use as much as we can and make sure to connect with our farmers as best we can. Um, and that's kind of just, I feel like I forgot what you asked at this point, but. No. Um, <laughs> it's, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. It's trying to trying to figure out <laughs> how to how to make a change at the local level, which is you know going from Washington to you. Yes. Uh, but how? So let's go even one more step local. So as the shopper who's going to the farmers market now, oh, I'm being responsible and I want to work with farmers and I want to buy their produce and shop organically. Um, is that just the best way to go to Logan Square every Sunday or go to Green City every Saturday and call it a day? I mean, that can't be that simple. I mean, I think it's, I mean, that's a fun way to do it. You know, yeah. going to the farmer's market has become too. fun. Expensive, it's, Yeah, it's not yeah. inexpensive. I was actually looking at today also, um, I mean, there's many different ways to find produce that is, that is good. And I think I was actually just texting the same farmer. I was like, what do you do with some of the leftover stuff from the farmer's market? Because just after talking to the kids that we talked to right before this, it made me want to find a way to like get that food to the right people, you know? Yeah. Um, you guys were really inspirational, by the way, and I know you're out there in the audience. Um, yeah, woo. Um, <laughs> um, I keep losing my train of thought because I'm just getting so excited about so many ideas. Okay. What yeah, is yeah, my I'm going well, to segue, though, based on something you just <coughs> said about using up uh, apples or something at the end of the season. You did a dinner, uh, a state dinner, I think, with Dan Barber, who is a very well-known chef uh, from New York City, Blue Hill at Stone Barns. Mm -hmm. I think I read you got married there, maybe. Is that I so? did. Okay. Oh, nice. um, I did my homework. Yeah. Uh, a fantastic, I've been to that uh, restaurant, by the way. It's, it's unbelievable. Amazing. He is getting a reputation now for cooking with, with waste, with mm -hmm. things that you would be throwing out otherwise, yeah. which seems like the ultimate way to go to, to, to be responsible. You guys cooked a full meal for a bunch of VIPs using things that were going to get thrown out. Yeah. So is that, is that practical now? Is that something we're trying well, to do? I think that's, well, um, it's not waste until it's thrown out. Uh, it's all really good food that's, uh, you know, not being seen for its value um, or has been neglected in some way. Uh, that dinner, it was actually a lunch you're referring to, and Dan and I did it at the UN just ahead of COP21 with about 40 presidents. Uh, no pressure. And <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I've been around presidents now, so that's like whatever. Uh, <laughs> but... <laughs> but I don't mean to say that. Okay, that sounded bad. <laughs> Erase that from the It's always recording. a big honor to cook for presidents. <laughs> uh, but it was 40 of them. It was like, it was like a whole room. It was like 80% of the world's power. And Ban Ki-moon had brought everybody together to try to line up everybody ahead of COP21, the big Paris agreement, which we now travesty, just a travesty that we pulled out of it. Um, and so... I was talking with the head guide to do it and sort of put this idea out there to try to raise awareness because all the talk in when we talk about climate change around energy, but the energy curve is actually going like this. We have a sight line to really bring down our carbon emissions from energy, but food and ag is going like that, uh, largely driven by uh, meat consumption. And certainly as developing countries are consuming dramatically more meat, it's going to become a serious problem. So we got the idea of like, well, let's cook waste lunch. and see you know see if we can raise some awareness which sounded like such a great idea we were super excited and then the night before i was like what the hell are we doing <laughs> like 
when you cook for like really important people, you want to give them like the cab, you know, you want to give them whatever it is you think tastes the best is what you give them. And right. we serve the most powerful room. I, they said they had never had that group of people around a table for a meal ever. Like they don't, it just doesn't happen like that. And you know, but we did it. And Dan's I, team is amazing, and it, it came out well. So like you're, you're peeling carrots and like the, the peel. Yeah, he, like, so he had like. Um, and you just eat the carrot and right. give them the peel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Was it That's that extreme? Nice. a little uh, <laughs> preserved lemon on it. Uh, no, it was like you know, it was like save vegetables. There was they called we called the Dan's name for it was the dumpster salad, uh, but it was like you know perfectly good stuff that was deformed or bruised that was going to get tossed. Um, Have you seen this? You can off? do ugly vegetables. Ugly vegetables. Yeah, that's what I was yeah. reading about today too. I actually sent them an email to see if we get because you can make beautiful food out of ugly vegetables. Yeah, I mean, um, part of it's just our yeah. expectation about aesthetic has driven a lot of the decisions uh, in the marketplace. Because, you know, we are trained, our evolution is to look for bright colored things, things that look beautiful. We eat with our eyes first. And so, you know, uh, people have been breeding, are breeding for getting you to buy it, not necessarily getting it to look, you know, uh, to taste a certain way. But it's also cool and it's also practical. And the history of your profession is to use everything. Right. You know, guys make a career like totally. Chris Cosentino in San Francisco. He's the awful king. He uses everything, right? So... At Publican and Evac, you guys use everything. So yeah. that hasn't changed, but I think people are getting uh, maybe more receptive to that, right? I mean, you've got a thing with pig face on your menu, so. Yeah, we use everything. Do you, you use do. everything. So yeah. that's a, I guess that's a good start, yeah? It is. I think, you know, I think today, um, before coming just in, I, was, I got to pre-shift and I said to my staff, what does sustainability mean to you? Because that was one of the questions you're going to ask me. Mm -hmm. And I was just curious what all of their responses would be. Yeah. Oh, I jumped ahead, you guys. Pretend That's I didn't okay. give it away. That's okay. Um, <laughs> what does sustainability mean book, to you? <laughs> um, but it was interesting that a couple of my uh, sous chefs and cooks that I asked first, I think they were just caught aback as why it's not like the normal conversation of, hey, what'd you do last night? It's like, what does sustainability mean to you? Much more important conversation. Um, and they... They kind of like, they couldn't come up with a good answer, yeah. but they, and then my friend of the house, one of the bartenders that we work with, who got us to um, take straws out of Girl and the Goat, and has, awesome. she got us to do compost, um, which is awesome. Um, she had like, you know, started going on and on, and it turned into our whole pre-shift conversation, which was great. Um, but we, then I kind of walked away feeling bad. I was like, no, I feel like I, you know, she started that. What do we do? And my manager came over and she's like, well, Stephanie, look at the menu and look at how we use, you know, you use everything that you can. We get in whole animals and we use every part of them. We get the pig heads of all the pigs that go to other restaurants that, you know, serve just pig skin or things like that. Um, so there is things that I think all restaurants do it for two reasons. You know, one, we'd use everything because financially we have yeah. to use everything. Yeah, you know, right. realistically, like that's where a lot of the nose to tail or head to tail started. Um, but now I think it's kind of seeing like, well, it's not just that. It's like, what is the point of wasting those bones, that skin, all of those innards? And first of all, they all taste really delicious, all of the bits. Um, so we're kind of, something that we were doing financially is actually doing the right thing anyways, which is, mm -hmm. it's kind of nice when those two things happen together. Mm -hmm. um, but also before they come in the back door, you have to make sure that that place is sustainably raised. Like salmon is a good example. A lot of people buy Atlantic salmon, not so responsibly raised. And there are companies now that are doing responsibly raised salmon. They're sort of pseudo sustainable. My understanding is, you know, the fishing practices have to be good and clean. You're supposed to put in if you put in four pounds of feed, you should be taking out four pounds of fish, roughly, right? There's a, so, well, salmon is a great example because there's always been that long debate of uh, whether you're gonna serve farm-raised salmon or not. Um, and wild salmon season is just about to kick in, which makes me very excited yeah. because it is the best salmon. I grew up eating salmon. That was the first fish that I ever ate. But I bet if I ate some of the salmon that I ate growing up, it was probably some not delicious salmon like some of the wild stuff that we get now. Um, but I have been to schooner salmon and I will speak yeah. for the fact that it is uh, something I'm very proud to serve in my restaurants when wild salmon's not in season. We actually just put it on the menu two weeks ago because I couldn't wait until wild salmon season started. So we <laughs> uh, got some shipped from Schuna, but they brought myself up and a bunch of other chefs just to kind of show us their practices. Um, and it was really amazing to see the, the care that's going into raising those salmon. And I wish this was about eight or six or seven years ago, so I can't like give you all of the proper information, but. Um, if you visit their website, if it's something that you're curious to read about, I think that they are doing it right. And they finally were recognized by um, like the Monterey Aquarium for saying that it oh, is okay. a st sustainable practice. So, um, But as a chef, yeah. you've got to do your homework now, too. You can't just, 
right? Have a yeah. vegetable guy bring stuff in. You've got to actually know all your purveyors and know where it's coming from and how it's being raised. Yeah. Well, fish is a huge, I mean, I think another thing, you know, with fish, not just salmon, but all of them, we tried to connect um, directly with fishermen as well. So it's the same thing as direct. We can't really get a lot of fish locally here also. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of things, but um, we work with a company called Sea to Table and also with Wolf's Fish. They're fishermen that connect directly with fishermen, so you're supporting these smaller fishermen rather than big companies. It's also coming right off the boat and getting here within a couple of days, so it's nice and fresh. But we know, then we know that it's being caught properly, mm -hmm. um, and it's not affecting or you know doing negative things to the environment, um, and that they're only catching fish that are that should be being caught at that time. So. Um, yeah, it's just, right. there's little things to, there's a lot of homework to do on all the things that we serve for sure. I want to go back to meat. You mentioned meat a, a second ago in your book, which by the way, the first couple of chapters are all vegetables, which I loved, and ways to grill and roast. Uh, but you talk about, um, you should support crops that release fewer greenhouse gases, repair the soil, and reduce carbon emission. And meat is a tough one. And this is, our culture is very much about burgers, and I see every other week that's either a taco place doing beef tacos or it's a burger place and it's it's we're Chicago. I mean we're the you know we were the hog butcher for the world and we love our beef here and our steak. So how do you get people to make those kinds of sort of incremental changes to start getting off of that because that's a really yeah. tough thing on the environment. Yeah. Uh, you know so I speak to this as a lover of steak. Uh, uh, I'm not a vegan uh, although no. No, you know you guys do what you want to do. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and you celebrate meat in the book, too. You yes. celebrate meat in your yes. book. Yeah. Uh, so, but, the, but there's just no question that we have to eat less meat. And um, it, if there's one thing you can do around uh, sustainability, if you had to only choose one thing, is to try to just reduce your, your, your red meat consumption um, and move down the, the chain to fish and we're going we're gonna to have to have farm-raised fish. That's just a reality. So we continue to improve on the sustainability side of that. And chicken is, uh, is also much more sustainable. Problems in the chicken world, for sure. But in terms of emissions, much better. Um, and I sort of look at pork as sort of like the gateway drug. You know, it's sort of like down the ladder you go. It's better. It's better than beef when it comes to emissions and impact. Um, but, you know, you can. But in the, in the end, we, we, we want to be mostly eating plants fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, and have some, some protein with that. Um, and that's why, it, you know, in the book, I tried to embrace meat, celebrate it. Um, so, it, you know, you're not saying it, you're bad if you eat meat. You're not bad if you have a steak. One way we, we did it in, in, in Washington was to, you know, we had steak Fridays. So, like, Friday, we had a steak. But the rest of the week, we weren't, we weren't, serving, we weren't serving beef. So it's more about, like, celebrating when you have it, get a really good quality piece of meat, enjoy it, um, and then, you know, make delicious, you know, amazingly delicious other things. Um, and there's no reason why, you know, in fact, like, you know, goat is, one could argue, much more flavorful than, you know, kind of a you know, filet, right? So there's like, the future doesn't have to be devoid of pleasure and flavor and, and deliciousness. In fact, you know, I think you could argue that those kind of dishes are much more flavorful than kind just, of the food we're eating now. We just did this, or there's this project that's going out there, and I wish I could say it was my idea, but it wasn't. But it's called the Blended, Bur Blended, Blended. Burger Project. Mm -hmm. um, the James Beard Foundation was helping spread the word about it to chefs. But basically, you just take either a quarter or a third of the meat out of the burger and put in mushrooms, which are very great to grow for the environment. So we have one on the menu at Little Goat if you want to come try it. Um, but we take shiitake mushrooms and sub in a quarter of the beef with mushrooms. It actually makes the burger taste exponentially better because yeah. mu I love mushrooms. Yeah. Um, and it, it's not saying don't eat a burger. It's saying let's take a quarter of that out and put in mushrooms. So it's kind of like baby steps to mm -hmm. it. But I think that those are kind of sometimes the more realistic approaches. Um, although there's also that other Beyond. burger. Beyond burger? Is it Beyond Burger? Oh, I just, Rick and I just Impossible interviewed for a podcast. Impossible, 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 Burger. Impossible Burger. And then this guy, Ethan Brown's the CEO of Beyond Burger, we just interviewed yesterday. They're in 20,000 grocery stores and restaurants. Do you guys know what this is? It's, it's like a the, pea protein, right? It's, they're, each one of them different. It's basically, they've taken uh, vegetable, mostly soy, honestly, uh, and craft, like made it into what looks and smells it and tastes, tastes like, like a burger. Have you, had, have you had it? Yeah, yeah, I've the, had them. The folks from Impossible Burger actually came to Little Goat, and I 
tasted it raw and you would think, you know, you're like kind of, I don't know. And it tastes really great as if you were using it for a tartare. And it does really taste like a burger. I actually was just at David Chang's restaurant um, in New York and he had it on his menu. And people were like coming into the restaurant just to have that for lunch. The guy sat down at the bar next to me and he's like, do you have any left? And the, and the bartender was like, don't worry, like we always have enough. But and that's the bloody one with the beets, right? The Impossible it's not Burger? Be uh, it beets? might have some beet juice in it. They basically studied all of the different, um, you know, why beef tastes the way it does, the protein compounds and such. And there's a really long scientific explanation that I was talked to about. But I just wanted to taste it. So let me, <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, so but I'm interested. Let me, if you don't mind, I would like to pose a question. Yeah. So yes. I struggle with this side. Like on the sustainability piece, it's, you know, wildly better than what we're doing. And there's a pragmatism around saying, you know, this is tastes the same, so you know it can be a replacement. I think there's a ceiling to it, but we can we'll see what happens. Um, the nutritionals are suspect, but we can like put that to the side for a second. We'll see what happens. In we'll a few put years. that to the side for yeah. a second. But just what about just as a chef? I struggle with. I don't like fake things. No, I mean, so, it's just like So, like, it's great. I, like, love it, and I hate, like, I don't know what I think about it. I and like I get asked about this all the time, because it's future food, I'm doing all this investment yeah. stuff, so it's like, every, I don't know, so what's your opinion? I mean, I, that's why I was more, I ended up doing the blended burger, burger project instead of the Impossible Burger, and, and not saying anything negative, but to me, it was just more, the way I wanted to go, because we're still serving, you're getting a burger, but we're just like, right. you know, we're kind of doing, um, adding the mushrooms into it to try to make it a little bit more sustainable. Um, I, yeah, I just couldn't put it on. It just didn't feel right because it wasn't something that is fitting for what we serve normally, but it is a really interesting thing to try. Yeah. And I think it's, right. it's great what they're doing. Um, Their yeah. market is like, they call them flexitarians, right? Is that, is that a real term, flexitarian? They have terms for everything now, apparently. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the blending birder was a blenditarians. I was like, I cannot say this. This is like, that's like such a long word right but now. People, but it's people just like yummy. Me. But I it's love just a yummy you know, burger. I love a good juicy burger like the next guy, but um, I do, as I'm getting older, like I've got to cut down my meat consumption a little yeah. bit. Well, health-wise, right? it's definitely yeah. better also to just do steak Fridays. Yeah. But well, that's actually part of what's powerful about this moment is that you're seeing a lot of convergence around basically, basically, not exactly, but basically what's good for us as humans and our health is the same thing that's good for the environment. And we can go down rabbit holes around like the specific practice of this particular farm. And that's chef's jobs, right? That's, you know, we should be the arbiters of doing that. You know, for, for most people, we're just trying to figure out like, I got 40 minutes to get the groceries before I got to get to soccer practice and then get the basketball and then whatever it may be. You know, it's like, don't worry about all that stuff. Like, just try to do the best you can with what you have. And I, you know, go through some of this stuff, just how to think about making these decisions. But if we're eating fruits and vegetables, I don't care how they're grown. If you can get organic, that's great. If you can get local, that's great. But if you're just eating fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, and not eating a ton of red meat, and just having a decent size of protein, you're going to be like 85% of the way there. And we get obsessed with trying to figure out and compare all these crazy conflicting messages that we're getting. And it's just too much. And so part of the whole point of, of, of what I'm trying to get at is like, everybody take a deep breath. Like, it's OK. Like, we're all going to be all right. And that's, and if we just focus on that core and get that right, then we can start worrying about the details later. And, and, and uh, we're just trying to simplify uh, this, because it seems just overwhelming and too complicated. I want to ask you guys about uh, just being in Chicago, and you worked in Chicago for a long time. It now seems like we're getting these massive greenhouses that are supplying mm -hmm. a lot of restaurants. Mm -hmm. Mighty Vine Tomatoes is about an hour or so west of here. I think it's in Rochelle, Illinois. Um, I've been to that facility. It's incredible. It's, I think there's a lot of Dutch people behind it, our technology. And then there's Gotham Greens, mm -hmm. which started in New York. Yeah. And there's now an enormous facility on top of a soap factory, I think, in Pullman on the south yeah. side. And a lot, I've seen it in the grocery stores and in restaurants. They say Gotham Greens right on the, uh, the menu. And it's typically some lettuces and basil and that lettuces sort of thing. And basil. So tell me about those two things. Is that kind of where we're headed to? And is that good? Uh, you know, from my vantage point, I think it's a. Uh, I think indoor growing, urban agriculture in that form uh, will have a role to play. I don't think in the foreseeable future it will be like the majority of what we're growing. And right now, basically the only thing that people are growing are leafy greens, of which we got a lot of, <laughs> uh, and you know some hothouse tomatoes. 
they're getting better on flavor. You know, like in the beginning of that world, it was like just tough, just tasted like water. They're getting better at um, stressing the plants and figuring out how to really get the full flavor out of them. So I think it becomes a real thing once we figure out how to grow like strawberries and blueberries and higher value crops, um, where, where you start to see the economics of those uh, entities really start to make sense on some kind of scale. So do I think they're going to solve all of our problems? No, but do I think in Chicago, can they play a great Chicago. role in the winter yeah. to get you some local greens? I think that's great. So I think we, we're always looking for like the right, the one thing. And the reality is in a system like this, there's going to be lots of different solutions. They're going to come in different shapes and sizes. They're going to have strengths and weaknesses. But it's going to be layering these different strategies and approaches that are going to, you know, in their entirety result in, in the solution, not any one silver bullet. I mean, I just feel like I'm looking at a menu in the middle of winter. I don't want to support uh, the tomatoes getting shipped up from Chile or Mexico or somewhere, because I know that's a, you're spending a lot of carbon on that, right? Yeah, I mean, I think in, I was just thinking this because our winter, like, I mean, it still didn't end, look at it today. Um, that our local yeah, produce, on, you know? our yeah. local produce has taken a little longer to get here this year. <laughs> Um, so we've, you know, I wasn't going to wait to put anything spring on the menus. So like we can't stick with just winter stuff forever. Um, but I was just thinking how I, and Gotham Greens, the guys who started that are amazing. Um, and the greens are fantastic. But yeah, that there's not enough things that are being grown that way to really help the menus either. So then we'll have potatoes and we'll have greens and basil. Um, so <laughs> it'll be really amazing if they are able to figure out how to grow more things. I always think of it in ramp season. I'm like, why can't they just figure out how to grow ramps? Ramps right. are actually what's, really hard, right? What's every happening chef here? gets so excited. They put ramps on everything this time. I of do. Year, right? I get really stressed actually yeah. because it's a lot of ramps to clean. <laughs> and then I'm like, so is it like you're so excited for ramp season? And then you're like, okay, maybe it's so, going to end soon. But we'll yeah. pickle a bunch and it'll be great. Pickle. I saw them two days ago and I was like, oh, ramps. And then I got home. I was like, I'm not cleaning these tonight. I'm too yeah. tired. <laughs> They're still in my fridge. I got to get home and like pickle them or something. <laughs> I want to yeah, ask you, you spend all your, most of your time on the north side, yeah? Because your, your business is on the north side. You grew up in Hyde Park. You went to lab school. Yep. Uh, and you played baseball down there, UFC. Yep. Uh, and, of course, the Obamas lived there. I'm curious to know. So the White Sox is what you said. Yes, I'm yes. White Sox. So we're Sox. Cubs versus Sox Yes, I'm a White right Sox now. fan. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Did you know there was more Sox fans here than Cubs no, fans? I, actually, I don't think there was, like, my dad cheering really loud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Way to start a fight here in Chicago. <laughs> very, very different challenges in terms of the, the food system. Yeah, oh yeah. Both sides, right? So tell me about that experience you had from South Side and what you know. You've worked on the North Side too. Yeah. Actually, I, I grew up in my earliest days in Logan Square uh, and then ended up moving to Hyde Park uh, later on. Um, uh, yeah, big challenges. Look, uh, these these um, how much money you have is determined on, on what you have available in your community and uh, how much money you have to buy it. And in fact, healthy food in lower income communities is more expensive than in wealthier communities, typically, because there's not the same volume, there's not the same market power, uh, and and so you end up having this very kind of vicious cycle. And we did a lot of work on this, and there's this, you know choice is always going to be a part of um, you know, independent choice is going to be a part of the system. You're not going to have government telling us exactly what to eat or what not to eat. But when you have to shop at a corner store or like a gas station to buy your food, you don't really have choice. And for so many parents, that's what they're dealing with. You know, in Philadelphia, for example, I remember we went to the opening of a grocery store there um, that hadn't had a, um, a grocery store in it for 10 years. And you just thought, you know, just I, I was there and it was beautiful and still thriving to this day because he really tailored it to the needs of that community, Mr. Brown, um, Jeff Brown, a wonderful man. Um, but you just thought about a child who was born when that last grocery store closed down. They're 10 years old uh, yeah. by the time there was actually produce in that, in that young person's community. And by that point, you know, their tastes are long since formed. Um, and that will dictate what they actually prefer to eat for the rest of their lives. Um, so having basic access to affordable food, I think, is one of the greatest challenges that we face. And part of my big gripe with people who are working on good food is that we're too satisfied on the, uh, you know, like doing it really, really well for a small group of people. Um, we have to figure out how to be a little less precious about our solutions and get them to a lot more people. Um, and if most of Americans don't have the ability 
to eat a, just a basic you know, apple or carrots or lettuce, um, we're failing, all of us are failing. Um, and so I think we have to turn our goals uh, a little bit uh, broader in that regard. Well, one of the kids in our pre-show was asking us about, you know, what do you do when, okay, we don't have a grocery store, a Whole Foods comes in, and then everybody moves out of the neighborhood because it's getting too expensive. We'll talk. And it's been happening, and you know, Pilsen has had some issues with graffiti on Pilsen. new restaurants that are My going in there. My sister lives in Pilsen, yep. That's exactly what's happening. Uh, this, is the, this is the city of Chicago. You, know, you want neighborhoods to get better and have more access to things and better food, but then what do you do when the property taxes go up? So that's sort of this eternal question, too. But um, I, that was a tough question for me to a answer, actually. I, was, I said, you know, aldermen make those decisions about what comes into your neighborhood. I think what, I mean, what that question just made sparked idea or made me want to do more though. You know, I think those are the young woman who asked that, she was pretty awesome. She had some great questions. Yeah. Um, and I followed up with your advisor afterwards to see if we could come do some cooking at your, um, with you guys. But I, um, I think it's like raising, it, raising those questions to people that maybe can, you know, like that question made me want to go out and figure out a way to do something to help. So it's, I think sometimes raising those questions and um, talking about it more and then not just talking about it though and really just finding a way to yeah, but those are questions that, look, all of, f food is one of these interesting things because so many of our big issues can be rooted in food or at least these big issues are affecting food. That's a problem of like jobs and minimum wage and affordable housing. So you can't, you can't have, um, you're not going to solve everything with it. Uh, and you have to be addressing the, the broad needs, needs of community. Like, so gentrification, you know, that's a, like a, it's a big weighty topic. Um, but no matter what, no matter where people are, no matter where they go, um, we just have to do a better job at, at getting this, these, this basic nutrition to, to kids and families. And schools are one of the big ways that, that, uh, that we have to do it. For so many kids, the vast majority of the calories that they're getting are in school. Sometimes just about the entirety of their calories are, getting, are happening in school. And, um, and we made a lot of progress on, you know, when we got into the White House, there was no standards on vending machines or a la carte lines. You literally could sell whatever you wanted. The standards hadn't been up, updated in, in 30 years and there hadn't been any new money in 20. And, um, and, you know, we made a bunch of progress, although I have family in Chicago public schools and they were saying, you know, sometimes it looks like the, some of these vending machines got some junk coming back into it. And my, my, those kids, my, our kids up there confirmed that it's getting a little shaky. So CPS, we're putting you on notice. Uh, I know reporters. We, I have moles in the schools, and I know reporters. We're on it. When you were when you were working on the front lines like that, and you were very much involved in Let's Move, how did you measure success? Because, like you say, you're trying to change the vending machines. What was yep. your what was measurable about that? Uh, we had different metrics of success. Uh, you know, the, one of the big metrics for me was, and it's hard to have a hard sort of barometer on it, but I think we're seeing it play out in all these different ways. Was when we got there, like nobody was really talking about food in the in the mainstream. There was like. There was some awareness that was getting, you know, on the words limb has sparked a bunch of thoughts and, and ideas, but it was really like food advocates yelling at food companies, and everyday people really weren't paying that much attention. So part of our main goal was to, um, the, for the first lady to put this issue in the middle of our country, in the middle of our culture, and in a language that people can understand in the places that they were. Um, so that's why you would see her like on Jimmy Fallon, like doing weird dances or making Jay Leno eat vegetables, which he literally never had in like 40 years. Oh. Um, you know, things like that. Yeah, he like famously would never eat a vegetable. She made him eat. Uh, it was vegetable pizza. It was, it was, we had a long negotiation with his team. Like, that's all okay, do. vegetable. It was like he was like five. It was like, okay, vegetable It'll pizza. It would be tomato sauce and dough and balls. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, but, um, but, but so raising awareness in our culture, making uh, basic nutrition, particularly for kids, a priority. Uh, so that, honestly, business people running businesses have more space to do more things. Because in the end, both, of our, both on the business side and on the political side, we're, we're a reflection of our culture. And businesses are only going to be able to go so far if people aren't asking for it or, and or pushing for it. And that's definitely true for politicians. Uh, politicians don't really lead on that stuff. They're designed to 
respond to the will of the people. Um, and so, um, you know, that was a big part of, and, and for food is, you know, culture is shaping our decisions way more than any policy is. So that was a big part of it. But we were also looking at things like food and vegetable consumption, uh, whole grain consumption, how much soda we were drinking, how much water we were drinking. So we had metrics around that, all of which move positively over our time there, which is really, really hard to do. Um, uh, and then you could see very specific things around what was been served in schools before and after, and you could see we made a ton of progress. You had an interesting quote in your book. You just talked about government not being followers. You said government and businesses were followers, not leaders. You came to understand not the awesome authority of the executive branch or the eternal dominance of McDonald's, but the surprising power of the choices we make. So, uh, you know, I'd just like to know, like for people in the audience, what kind of choices could they make that are simple and easy and you know, they don't have to think too much about, well, oh, I'm going to be a vegan today, or I'm going to get rid of all yeah. of meat in my diet. But, you know, what simple changes can people make in, uh, from either of you? Yeah. Um, you know, I think, um, I think trying to cook one more time a week is a really good place to start. Because no matter what you cook, uh, you're, you're going to most likely eat less calories, more fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, less sugar, fat, and salt. Does Blue Apron um, count? Because I do Blue Apron. Yes, Blue Apron absolutely counts. Okay. Blue Apron absolutely They're not my sponsor of my podcast, I'm just saying. <laughs> but I like Blue Apron. But you'd like them to be. I would like them to be, <laughs> yes, actually. Thank you. I just, I, I know a couple people, I'll put in a good word okay. for you. Right. Uh, um, no, it absolutely counts. So I think that's a good place to start. I think another good place to start is, you know, I think everybody knows sort of direction. Like most Americans, the vast majority of Americans, are actively, we're all actively trying to eat better. We're trying to make changes, but a very small percentage of us actually do it. There's this huge gap. I mean, it's because we don't, we haven't focused on like actual strategies. So I think one big thing you can do, whatever it is your goals are, eat more vegetables, eat more you know, dried fruit, maybe nuts, whatever it may be, is you want to surround yourself in your house, in your kitchen, with those products. Because in the end, we eat what we see. So like Coca-Cola built their business on a very simple term called it was within an arm's reach of desire. Their whole business strategy to shape the whole entire country, company was surround people with Coke and then make them want to drink it with a little marketing. So in our, so, but we eat what we see. So like right now you walk in your house, there's a bowl of chips on the counter. You look at the bowl of chips, you say to yourself, Oh, I would love some chips. It's like, you, know, you didn't want those chips. You just saw those chips. <laughs> and then you thought to yourself, oh, I would like the chips. So you can do a long, go a long way by just setting yourself up for success and so you're not like battling yourself in your own kitchen. So put the bowl of fruit out. Put the chopped vegetables at eye level. You know, put some nuts in a clear. This is all stuff I did with the Obamas uh, in Chicago on the south side. Take glass jars, put whatever those healthier snacks are. You don't have to, you know, get rid of all of your treats. Just like put them on the top shelf in the back, so that no, for real, this will have a huge impact on what you actually consume, because then you're going to eat it only when you really want it. And if that's the case, then that's great, um, but not because you're just walking through and see it and you have a handful of M and M's as opposed to a handful of almonds. My mind is going through my cupboard right now. I'm Me thinking, too. I, have a, <laughs> yeah. I do have a quart container for she kisses. I'm going to have to paint that, like cover the outside of it so I can't. Yeah, see keep them, but just. But yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it's, I think the, the one step towards cooking one more day at home is such a huge, and I'm like the worst, I, my husband ordered pizza tonight because I left to come here and I was like, just order pizza. There's nothing really around to cook. <laughs> I'm sorry I didn't go to the grocery store today. Um, so I get, it happens to everyone, you know, yeah. like we can't sit up here and pretend that we don't do those things totally. too, but, um, but definitely I think just having that as a goal and kind of, I think just really planning out your week and thinking about grocery shopping. Yeah. And I grew up in a household where my mom, um, every Sunday she posted a, the week of what we were going to eat every day for the oh, week, like a menu. Awesome. So like we knew, like we all got together on Sunday, my mom, my sister and I, and we flipped through cookbooks and we would put up what we were going to eat each day. Oh, so our friends awesome. could be like, I'm going to come over for roast beef and Yorkshire pudding <laughs> on Thursday, or I'm going to come over for tempura. Like I was very fortunate to grow up in a household that we ate a lot of really cool stuff. Um, and we would go to the grocery store buying exactly what we knew we needed for each yeah. recipe. So we, my mom always bought exactly what we were going to use. Yeah. Um, and we always had Thursday night, I think was actually, it was either Wednesday, Thursday, it was like leftover nights. So we'd eat like half the week, we would have leftover nights, we could eat what was left, and then we'd eat a few more days and have leftover night. Um, at the time, I really, I was like, I don't like leftover night, overnight, mom. 
I like to cook something new. Um, <laughs> but I think if she had reimagined those leftovers, which is something that we you yeah. know, have been focusing on just in food waste, then I would have been more excited about it. So yeah. I think cooking more at home and also just when you have those leftovers, don't just like throw them in the microwave and just reheat them. Just think, how can I put these together to make something mm -hmm. new that my family's gonna be excited to eat that, or that you're gonna be excited to eat? And the choices we're talking about here are all related to what you're doing at home, not when I go to a restaurant and I wanna indulge and have kohlrabi with, I don't know, or fish sauce That's and That's your indulgement, it's kohlrabi? <laughs> yeah. Wow. I mean, we do have a good kohlrabi yeah, salad, Steve, you're but you should be living healthier, man. Chow hound, you know, dude, like, live a little, I, man. I eat a lot of pizza. <laughs> What we did at, um, at Girl on the Goat, and if you've been to Girl on the Goat like probably a few years ago and then you've been there now, um, we started to look at really what all was being put into go boxes and going home with people and mm. really trying to think about, and you know, again, like is it financially beneficial for us to have smaller portions? Sure. But also like what's the point of giving stuff that people, that's always going to go into the back and get scraped into the garbage. So we really, I talked to the servers, again at pre-shift, it's where we talk about these things. What are the things that people never finish? They're like, you know what, as much as everybody loves the green beans, there probably could be like, you know, a little small handful less green beans in there because a party of two can never finish it. Even a party of four can't necessarily finish it when they're getting all this other stuff. So, um, you know, it's a restaurant where we want to encourage people to try a lot of different things, but we don't want to waste all of that food. So really thinking yeah, about I, that, and I think, you know, it's little things in restaurants, but, you know, even though I'm, I always feel like I'm more focused on what's happening at home. Can we have a come to Jesus with steakhouses in Chicago? Because I, I hate when I see all those side dishes coming to the table and half of it gets eaten. But that's a la carte, yeah. It's just, it, you know, no one needs potatoes as large as your head, right? I think it's good. I mean, I think that what we, at Little Go, what we do is like, everything's a la carte. So you, yeah. you know, you yeah. have to, if you want bread, you order bread and you buy it. Doesn't just, a bowl of bread doesn't come, just come to the table that's then gonna get thrown away because you decided you don't wanna eat bread. Or French fries, like not every sandwich needs to come with a giant mound of French fries. You can get French fries for the table and you can all share them. I think um, just, you know, doing a little bit more a la carte at restaurants and having you order the sides and making them a little bit, you know, more what is actually gonna get eaten is a good way to reduce food waste. And I, I've also noticed being engaged in the community has really been helpful for you. You do so many events. You've created this Harvest Fest in the fall. Uh, to connect with farmers and people, and you find that that lets you do some things or not be, sound preachy when you're trying to promote something and get a point across, right? Yeah, I think um, it's always important to kind of bring things, kind of try to make it a little bit fun at the same time. It's funny, on the way out here, um, Darcy, a friend of mine who's with me, she's like, have fun. And I was like, I mean, are you, should you say that when you're going on stage to talk about sustainability and about organic and things like that? But I think it should be a little oh, yeah. bit fun because yeah. you want to have people want to talk about it and have it be part of conversation. And that sort of, it spreads the word a little bit more if you can add a little fun into it. Um, you know, for Harvest Fest, we pick organizations that can have an impact. Last year, um, we raised money for Pilot Light, which is a program that goes into the schools and teaches about food, or teaches about different subjects of school, like through food, um, talk about history through food, talk about um, different cultures through food. Um, so we, you know, we had this fun giant party on the street so we could raise money for a great organization and also have them there talking about it. So I think it's a really great to like surround it with things that make us happy and kind mm -hmm. of get you excited to talk about it. Um, so that's kind of the way, you know, instead of just standing there and just saying the facts, I think it's important to put those out there, but um, <coughs> educate through, you know, I don't know, through different means. I was gonna ask you, do you think that kind of that's the future now, like NGOs, since the administration now isn't that involved or interested in doing what you were doing, you know, and getting really you know, yes. grassroots, <laughs> um, do you think that's where we're gonna go now? You gotta get organizations like Pilot Light in a city to do something on their own, to get into the schools, to get kids to think differently about food and to put food in front of them and see how it's grown and get them excited about it because it's not gonna happen from the government level. Well, I think part of the mistake that we made, and honestly, we made it through the eight years of the Obama administration, is that we thought that, you know, he's got it. Uh, and, you know, we kind of dropped the ball, to be honest with you. Um, government's not going to solve these kind of problems, particularly these kind of problems. There's a role for government to play, for sure. But in the end, this is up to us to change our restaurants and to change our schools and to be engaged and to be citizens and to vote and to get other people to vote. Um, and when we get complacent, um, you know, stuff happens, uh, yeah. and, and it has real consequence. Um, and I think that's a, that's a big part of what's happened. And so I think, 
Um, so the answer is yes, but the answer is yes, not because that guy is in the West Wing, uh, but it's because that's, the, that's yes all the time. Um, and you know, when you're talking about changing things that are so deeply rooted in how we understand who we are, it's how we understand who we're not, it's how we show love to each other, it's super complicated. And so change, so when, I, you know, when you're trying to change something about what we're eating, you're trying to change something about who we are. And um, that's gonna have to happen in millions of little ways in, in every kitchen, in every restaurant, if we're actually gonna really change it. It's not gonna come down from above. Also so, kind of like generationally. You absolutely. Know, I think we were talking a little bit about Common Threads earlier. There's so many great organizations that I, you know, Common yeah. Threads, Blessings in a Backpack, I think so. there's so many different great organizations, but Common Threads teaches kids at a young age um, about healthy eating, and the hope is that they will then bring that back to their parents and kind of spread mm -hmm. it into their families. Um, I think it's important to start with, you know, of course worry about everybody that's older than that, but really start young and really Absolutely. try to, like you said, your tastes develop when you're, um, when you're a child, so really trying to get into the classrooms at a younger age and try to affect things then. And as we told that young woman, if she's excited about something, but her friends in one neighborhood over are going to the gas station to get their food, she's gotta pull them in with mm -hmm. her to get them as excited about it as she is, right? Because that's the only way it's gonna spread. Yeah, I mean, it's, this is our culture. We're talking about our culture here. And so we have to get to a place where we're eating a bunch of junk, drinking a bunch of sugary drinks and, you know, for breakfast, and like laying on your couch is just not cool. Like that's just not how we do it. No, it's to my own people, right? I mean, that's just the, gotta be the, that's just not how we do it. That's not what we value. That's not what we aspire to do. Uh, and we have to start thinking much more like in a, in a marketing way. Like how do we aspire, particularly this next generation? You know, like none of the athletes that they look up to, none of the rock, pop, you know, pop stars, do you think Beyonce is drinking a bunch of stuff? No, Beyonce is eating real healthy and working out real hard. Yeah. Uh, and so we, we've, you've lots of other companies take that kind of power and put it towards, you know, foods that most of the time they don't eat. Uh, we have to figure out how to take that same kind of those cultural relevant, relevance symbols, people, um, and experiences and put them towards eating better. So yes, th this is, it's going to happen in all of these little ways. And like, what you're doing is like, that's it. There's no, it's not coming from like the clouds. It's like, that's the real change. And it's hard. And it's like, sometimes the numbers are hard to figure out how to make them add up. Like, you know what you want to do, but then you're just not going to come close to a margin. And so it's a real struggle and people aren't willing to pay a little more yet because they don't fully understand the value and whatever that new approach is. You know, it's complicated. And, and we need people to be calling for this. Like when I really got turned on to even caring about this, was when I, very early in my training in Vienna, uh, and uh, you know, I, I was make this the suit. I'm going to tell a really quick story, but it really I think encapsulates this whole thing. Which is, he said, make this rhubarb sauce, cook the rhubarb down, and then I'm going to clean it up for the audience, and then put in a lot of butter. Uh, and so I said, okay, so that's what I did. I cooked it down, put in the butter, and he said, no, he, he called me Yankee. He's like Yankee. I said in the butter. Uh, and I had put in a ton of butter. And so I like took a huge other big thing and put it in. And he walked up to me. He was so pissed off. To this day, a wonderful guy, best cook I've ever cooked with. He was like, I said in the butter, if the guest walks out of my restaurant and drops dead of a heart attack, it's not my problem. The guests asked me to make the food taste good and not be good for them. And you know what? He was exactly right. That's what people have been asking him to do. And, and it really rocked me. It set me, that moment set me on my, you know, totally. I, at that, day, that day I stopped reading cookbooks, started reading like weird taxation food policy books and like history of agriculture books. <laughs> it really messed me up. <laughs> Worked out okay. <laughs> Thank God that happened, I guess. Um, but, um, but, 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 the rea but that was really true. And what's happening now is that people walking into your restaurant aren't just asking you to make them craziest, most you know, decadent thing. They're asking you to make food that has value, that comes from values and principles and has a certain ethos to it. And you can do that now because, you know, we're as a community saying, this is where we want to go. And so I think we really can't under, it, it's hard to understate, to overstate that power. And then that's really what it's all about. 
And do you find guests want the transparency? They want to know exactly what's going into everything and where it's from? Are they asking questions about how was the chicken treated like they are in Portlandia and that kind of stuff? <laughs> <laughs> I think um, not down to that exact thing, but we are ready for those questions, which yeah. I think is important. So if you go in and ask a server at Girl and the Goat where the chickens came from, they will tell you about Walter Moser, our farmer, who we get them from. Um, they, you know, we make sure that our servers know where everything comes from. So one, they're proud to serve what they're serving, um, and also they can answer those questions. And you know, I'm not going to lie; they're not maybe not all of those questions from Portland yet. I don't know if they could tell you exactly where every little thing on the menu was grown and such, but that is a new goal. Did now he have a good life? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they did. Yeah, he, just had, he just had one bad day. Yeah. yeah yes. That's what one of my farmers said once. Yeah. Uh, great, one bad day. But uh, but I think but but. When you have chefs who take it seriously and are and doing the right thing, you just you go in and you tr you have trust and faith that you know that's the chef's job. It's actually not the eater's job to, you know, give you a pop quiz every time they walk into the restaurant. Uh, they should just know they're eating in places that people are. You know, they want to eat in places where the chef is to, you know responsible for being the arbiter of what products that they're using based on a certain set of values and principles. And I think that's you know that's the chef's role. I gotta say like. You know, restaurants, to, you know, to a point you made earlier, you know, just being indulgent certainly has a place. But this idea that somehow chefs don't have to have any regard for the well-being of the people that are coming through the restaurants, and that's true if you have one restaurant or if you have 13,000 restaurants, whatever the case may be, I think is just garbage. Like, that's like an old way. Um, the future chef is one that has some care about the people who are eating in their restaurant. Uh, or big food chain, um, has some care about the impact on the environment of where they're sourcing their products, and tries to put those two things together in a way that is super delicious and enjoyable, but does not just dismiss that because, oh, people want to have a good time. Um, that, that, that thinking is of the past. The next generation, that's not how they're thinking. And I think the businesses that don't get on board with that new way, that, that where the culture is going, are not going to succeed. All the fastest growing, most successful restaurants, both big chains and, and little ones, take these things into account. So that's the future. Um, and it's a, you know, we're better for it. Yeah. Um, we've only got a couple minutes left here. We've talked for an hour. It's pretty amazing. That's a long, uh, that's a, a lot of talking. Um, you guys must be getting bored of us. We talking. are. <laughs> Why don't we hear from them? We are going to do that now. Exactly. So we're going to, we're going to, I think we've got about 15 minutes or so. We are going to turn the lights up a little bit. We're going to have about 15 minutes of questions. Now, there are folks from Chicago Ideas Week on either side in the aisles with microphones. There you guys are. So here's how it's going to work. If you have a question, just make your way to the end of the aisle and then line up, uh, I guess, behind that person up along the edge of the stairs. Uh, we've got a question over here. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you to all of you guys. Um, it's nice to be here, and uh, thank you for Chicago Ideas for inviting us and Fair Life as well. Um, I believe uh, you did talk about it, not explicitly, but uh, uh, if possible, I would like you to uh, uh, comment a little bit uh, about a big player in this uh, scenario, which is um, the a chain of supply, mm -hmm. right? So big uh, 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 grocery stores uh, and their chain of supply determine what we eat. You know, when I think about my cereal, I measure my cereal being uh, blueberries and strawberries, and that's the only way I measure my cereal being in February or now. Um, so with that being said, I just would like to, to ask you uh, to comment a little bit, how uh, do we tackle that? How do we, uh, as we are concerned about what we eat, uh, most of those in chain of supply, distribution, mm -hmm. that make uh, you know, the QEs from uh, Chile to get here no matter what, mm -hmm. uh, uh, how do we tackle uh, uh, the way they commoditize what, uh, and determine what we eat and find at the grocery stores? Um, so, from my experience, actually, uh, retailers don't really, um, they just care about selling things. Uh, they're not, they don't have much loyalty to any specific brand other than their own and their relationship with their customer. Um, and so, they're really, they're very sensitive to what you want. 
like way more than you realize. Uh, and what? You're in, you're in retail. So you understand. I mean, retailers are terrified every day of losing a customer, of not meeting that, uh, that need. And I'll just take a minute to say, you know, Sue at Fairlife, like, they weren't in, when did you start? When did you start really getting distribution? 2012. Think about that. That's six years ago. What they're doing, if you guys ever can go to that farm, you guys should go. I could not be a bigger fan. I just want to take a minute to say, and I'm going to tie this into your retail question. They are doing amazing stuff that has real values, that's a better product, that has a real brand behind it. And in, in six years, they're this massive company because they've met a need. People bought it because they wanted it, and it grew. So you had a company that stepped out of the box, did something bold and innovative, asked what was you know, the values that they should be pursuing, which is better nutrition for the people who are drinking and better sustainability in an industry uh, that's come along, but you know, was really lagging for many, many years. And now all of a sudden it's in every retailer in, in America, so, or just about. So you gotta really engage with the consumer, find companies that are meeting their needs. So like the, the, the retailer that I referenced in Philadelphia, there had been a big box store that just popped down, same, uh, same things that they would have in anywhere, and they failed. The, the guy who came in spent the first six months meeting with everybody in the community and asking them what they wanted. And it turned out there was like five or six populations of very distinct people. I think there's a big Haitian population, a big Dominican population. There's a number of different, which all had very different needs. And he ended up just having a grocery store that met the specific needs of that community, and he's killing it on the financials. So taking some time to actually understand who your consumers are, you're going to get, you know, you're going to, I think, retail will change um, in that way. And consumers have to start saying, this, they, this is what I want. This isn't working for me. You have more power in that than I think people realize. OK. Hello. Um, I was wondering if you could both kind of share if you have a dish or a meal that you make that kind of encapsulates the theme of everything we're talking about tonight that you'd be really proud of as an example of this kind of theme of sustainability. And then a slightly lighter question, just I, if you're allowed to tell us what the Obama's favorite meal was <laughs> when you were in the White House, I'm just dying to know. So you, you know, you've just continued an eight year streak. That's, I've, never, I've never had a conversation where that wasn't asked. I was getting worried. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Shouldn't we just say that she, they should buy the book to get the recipes? Right. Also, you guys are getting tonight, there's a pamphlet that I made as an addition to my book that is what to do with all the leftovers. Not all of them, but some, it's uh, like 10 different recipes of so things good. to do with some of the leftovers from the book. So say if you make the pancakes from the book and you have those four pancakes sitting on the table and maybe a little batter and everybody's full, you can take those and melt a little chocolate and you make this awesome cake that stays good in your fridge for a few days. Um, but there's a whole, and it's just sort of the Kill point it. of it. I know that's not the healthy eating thing we were talking about, but it's leftovers. So you gotta have fun. Um, you gotta have some yeah, fun. Yeah, you gotta have some fun. Um, but the idea be, I was just proud of that because it's the idea is like saying you can make delicious things. Even there's a grilled carrots recipe in the book. And if you have like four leftover grilled carrots, chances are you might just toss them. You're like, it's four carrots. But you can turn them into this great vinaigrette to make a great salad for your lunch the next day. So just kind of so giving good. you ideas of things to do with your leftovers that are just as delicious mm. as the original ideas. Um, so you guys are all, those pamphlets are outside for you guys. That's so good, huh? Great. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, and now to the question that you've always been asked. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in terms of the recipe, I mean, God, it's like the whole book tries to capture that. I, I don't know. I can't pick one. Uh, it's like picking, you know, you can't pick a child. They're all your babies. Uh, you know how often I get asked, what's your favorite restaurant in Chicago? Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> so what is it? <laughs> I could ask that too. I had an interview today. You set yourself I can't up answer for that. that question. You set yourself up for that. Right. Um, so when I was in the White House, this is what I was saying to our crew uh, earlier. So when I was in the White House, I could say that's top secret information. I can't tell you what their favorite foods are. But now you can. And most of the time, people believe that. Uh, <laughs> of, course, of course, it was not top secret. Uh, uh, the reality is, like, they didn't have, there's, I don't have anything crazy for you. They ate really simple food, uh, you know, they practiced what they preached. We weren't out there, like, telling the country to, you know, uh, eat all healthy, and then we were just eating, like, you know, tons of pizza every night or something like that. Um, she does love French fries, famously. Um, he loves a good burger. 
But I mean, they were a regular family. So it was like brown rice and broccoli and some grilled chicken. It was like st every week we had something like that. You know, it was like a lot of fish, nothing, nothing crazy. The girl's love for me was directly correlated to what I was cooking for dinner, though. <laughs> I was the man if I ever made mac and cheese. Or, That's great. But if, uh, if it was fish night, it was like, I barely got a hello. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, oh, yeah, hey. Over here? Could, could you talk a bit about portion control? I was in uh, LAX last night, and I thought I'd buy a candy bar. And they were all these enormous things the size yeah. of fireplace logs. And you're yeah. cutting green beans at Girl on the Go, but you go to Costco and there are these enormous troughs of food. Yeah. What can we as consumers try to push companies towards getting us smaller sizes that we could use? I mean, I think, you know, we can do portion control. The restaurants, like I was saying, we've lowered some portions and things. But I think the tricky bit is what you were just saying about what, that it's consumers have to start to, like, want that even more and I think yeah. you know unfortunately a lot of times people are they are upset when the package size is really small um, I was just actually walking through the store and not that chips are a good topic of conversation right now but um, <laughs> but the Doritos bags are smaller now yeah. uh, but we were talking my husband and I were talking about portion controls and some things but unfortunately I think that they just made they're charging the same price they just did that for a purely financial situation I think companies um, well but, companies do it because they want to give you perceived value right? right and so you go to cheesecake factory and they'll tell you take some home for the, uh, lunch the next day you don't have to eat it all right now but you want to see perceived value on the plate yeah right now consumers are the problem there's plenty of I've talked to lots of different uh, um, you know, restaurant chefs or bigger companies, uh, and people don't want, they, they were paying 10 bucks for that plate, they don't want to pay, uh, you know, the same price for less, and if you, particularly if you're a big company, you can't all of a sudden just start, start making less money. So there, there's a real, uh, there's a real tension there. I was and there was this, there was a basically an arms race around size, because the, the, the food cost, particularly in like any kind of packaged good, is a very is a tiny, tiny percentage of the cost of that ingredient is of that product. It is almost it almost doesn't really matter. Like it almost it barely shows up in the in the cost. So for them, adding like 50 more chips like costs like literally about a penny. Uh, so you might and you can charge 50 cents more. So every for every chip you can sell, you're making some kind of profit on it. That's the problem. So we have so but you have started seeing bigger companies do 100 calorie pack portions, like, yeah. yep. smaller things, said. because people are saying, I don't want this big portion. So we just gotta, so sir, whenever you're in the, the airport next time, just don't buy it. Do whatever you can. Oh, I saw that there was, <laughs> I was at the airport a couple days ago and I was having a chocolate craving and there's that giant Toblerone thing, right? And I'm like, I could get that. Or the giant, and they only have like a family sized portion at the airport and you're traveling by yourself. I ended up, I was so proud of myself. I got an RX bar that had, said it was chocolate. There's no chocolate in it. There's like those five ingredients. Yeah. But it was really great. That satisfied go. my crazy craving. Right. When, they see, when, the, when the marketers see that the 100 calorie packs are selling great, that's what they're, they're going to more. Right? Yeah. yeah. Over there? Sure. Uh, good evening. Um, Sam, I have to really double down on what you just said about oh. Sue McCloskey and uh, Fair Oaks Farms. Okay. I flew here from San Francisco and I brought a team to spend the day at Fair Oaks and Sue's really been kind of my North Star uh, personally and professionally for the past 12 years and that place is fabulous if you haven't been out there, so please go. Um, my question for you, uh, Sam, is about, you know, who is going to finance the future of food. Great question. Um, I work for perhaps the most well-capitalized uh, ag tech company in the world. What is we are, that? Uh, we are backed by um, a venture fund. Okay. Uh, and, and You're going to tell us what your it, company is? Or <laughs> is it a secret, the most well-funded company in the world? We'll talk about it later. <laughs> uh, so, so my wow. question for you uh, as a venture capital investor is, how do we rectify this demand for really quick returns on a product that has really low margins and takes more time to prove out its, its value? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, basically what's happened is you have a bunch of big tech investors who are used to like, you know, Google returns uh, where you, or you have a piece of software where if it adds a lot of value, it can just be you know, disseminated really fast. Uh, with these crazy expectations. Now food is the hot new thing, and you have a bunch of people who don't know anything about food investing in it with the same set of expectations around 
returns on their investment. And that puts terrible pressure on companies that are young and vulnerable to make terrible decisions for their long-term health to satisfy the pressures of these investors. Uh, you should only take money from smart food people like us and <laughs> stop taking your money, whatever mystery company you are, <laughs> from these dumb, arrogant tech investors. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but but it, but it but it but it is well. I'll say one other. I will say one other point to that is that um, this space has been wildly undercapitalized for a long, long time. In fact, when you think about innovation, like think about the kitchen, like the kitchen is basically unchanged in the last seventy-five years, without the exception of the microwave. Like our whole lives have been totally transformed. Just in my lifetime, has been totally transformed. Our phones, everything is completely different and yet the kitchen is exactly the same and so relative to the rest of our lives cooking and spending time in the kitchen you know takes that much longer so we, we have to figure out how to make this whole world much more uh, simple for people we need much more innovation we have had almost none of it except for like how do you hyper process there's certain processes that have been incredibly innovative uh, certain seeds have been really you know gotten a ton of capital um, but not for the outcomes that benefit consumers and eaters. So I think we need a ton more capital in this space and smart capital with longer horizons on returns so that these companies can grow in a way that stays true to the value and the mission and not get forced to make bad decisions. Let's do one more brief question and then brief answer. All right. So if dogs have the same taste buds that humans do and you had to impress them with your best dish, what would it be? <laughs> If dogs do. <laughs> I have never been asked that question. No, that was a good one. I feel like I've been asked just about everything. That's, that's a new one. It's a tough one. You're, you're up. If we're trying to impress dogs with food? What are you um, serving? What are we serving? I mean, my dog, the other day, he just ate an avocado, and he somehow like, got Whoa. it open and didn't eat the pit. I'm impressed with my dog's avocado taste. Avocado toast. These days, I could give him avocado toast, but... I mean, I'll just Avocado say, toast. I think he'd be happy with the pig face. I think that he'd be yeah. impressed with the pig face. You want to try to tackle that one? God. Roasted vegetables? I don't even know. That's so good, man. You stumped me. Yeah, like a roasted sweet potato, I guess. I don't okay. know. Okay. I don't even know where to start. I don't even know how to Your approach that. Your dog's going to come over for the pig face. I don't know. All right, well, I listen. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Always good to end on a light note.